Hello everybody and welcome to another Doctor Who review. This time I'm reviewing a 13th Doctor story. It is The Witchfinders. Okay, so here we go. The 8th episode of Series 11 of Doctor Who. The first season with Jodie Whittaker as the 13th Doctor. Um, basic plot line, the, the fam ends up in... Um, early 17th century Lancashire. Um, they soon find that there is lots of witch burning going on and witch finding going on through the local um, landlady or uh, lady of the house of the of the land, Becca Savage. There is a scene where she ducks her own grandmother and um, the doctor very quickly figures out that maybe there's something more to the whole witch trials than just a case of uh, people being burnt or dipped for being witches and 35, 36 people being killed by the time they arrive. Spanner of the Works happens, though, when um, King James himself arrives and takes a slight shine to Ryan. Uh, doesn't quite believe the Doctor. The Doctor gets accused of being a witch at one point. It's an interesting scene, which we'll get to later. She ends up getting duped, manages to survive and escapes with the thanks to Houdini. And at that point, it's found that Becca is actually the one who's effectively the witch, who's been affected by an alien species called the Morax, and she is the queen of the Morax. And what happened was that Becca had cut down a tree on top of Pendle Hill, a local hill in the area, and that inadvertently was a prison lock, um, which then released the Morax, the Morax queen, and ultimately the Morax was taking over Becca's body and taking over some locals um, who died as vessels, to infect everybody else, and um, the Doctor um, ends up um, putting the Morax back into their prison cell um, with the help of King James killing off Becca overall. It's an interesting story to watch. It's it's good for most of it, and then the last 10 minutes are a little bit iffy, and I'll come to that as we go along, but let's go into the cast of characters and just go through some of the main characters here. We have, of course, the Doctor, Jodie Whittaker, Full flow, full talking, full psyching everything out. There's very much the fact that the the companions are there to help. They're not there to give any ideas or give any suggestions to the Doctor. The Doctor's really figuring out everything for herself. She's talking through everything. It actually is a detriment to her in this one because it ends up people being more suspicious of her because of being a woman. There is a comment at one point, which is very rare in this era, that the Doctor refer, refers to herself as being a disadvantage of being a woman. Um, but this is one of the two instances, I remember, where she um, comments on her, sexu her sexuality in that respect and the fact that she is a different gender from what she normally is. And she comments when she gets frustrated trying to explain everything about the fact that what's happening with the aliens, along with Becca and uh, uh, Willa, um, Becca's niece, and also uh, Becca's cousin, rather, and um, King James, when she's trying to explain in the middle of the story about the fact it's not, it's not um, witches or Satan, it's just basically a situation of an alien presence and trying to get everybody on board. Becca... It doesn't want to be sussed out as being the cause, so she blames the Doctor as being a witch, uh, which then turns uh, King James and eventually Willa as well. And that kind of nice little turn you get there with all the characters. I'll get a bit more about that in a minute. But overall, the whole the whole fact that the Doctor is fighting against kind of prejudice a little bit is an interesting way of writing it. It's done quite softly, but it, it, it still makes an interesting bit of drama in the middle of the story and makes it interesting overall to watch. Jodie plays it with a plum. She plays it strong. What she's given, she's managed to memorise the words and make it sound flowing. She's not um, just droning on a monologue when she's talking about monologues and describing things and figuring things out. It's a very verbal Doctor, the 13th Doctor, and you can see that in the performance here. It, I do like the way the performance works here. I do like the character overall. I think the character's really good. And this is the story where we see the big injustices of the world and of the universe and how the Doctor fights them in her own little way and uh, tries to talk her way out of the situation. She's not very much a, uh, she is a little bit of a doing, but she's more a talking Doctor, which is something that's quite unique and interesting for the Doctors post John Pertwee, because because most of the Doctors tend to be a bit more action. The 13th Doctor is one of the rare um, talk out of situation Doctors, but it doesn't quite work in this situation because of the prejudices of women at this stage. And there is a, a deep frustration with the Doctor at various points about that. And then we've got Graham played by Bradley Walsh. He's probably the best of the three. He get he doesn't get much to do, but he's the best. He's the best of the three in regards to what they what role they have and how they get and how he gets involved with the plot. 
um, to an extent. Um, he is seen as the leader by King James. He's seen as the witch finder general and tries to get his way around it and, and kind of is okay with it. He seems to be the leader of the three when, when they're out on their own trying to search for things for the Doctor to help with the mystery of the mud and the mud creatures, as they're called at one point. Um, and overall, it's a strong performance from Bradley Walsh, as it always is. And um, yeah, it was, it was a nice little role there. You then got um, Toes and Co playing Ryan. Um, he's the weakest of the three in regards to the acting. He is seen as kind of like the exotic plaything for King James, and he does utilise that a little bit, which is interesting to see. But ultimately, he's not really that impressive. I think he's a little bit off, and it kind of shows in the performance a little bit. It, it's solid enough, but it's not It's not anything to shout home about. He, he's trying to do a Sheffield accent, but he's got a London as his normal. He doesn't quite get the Sheffield accent. He doesn't do. He doesn't do what... Bradley does and accept he comes from a different part of the country. They're trying to make Ryan out to be somebody who comes from Sheffield and he doesn't and sometimes Toes and Co doesn't quite match it. And there's a couple of instances here where you can hear that. He's not quite getting the accent right. One person who does get the accent right from Sheffield, of course, is gonna be Amanda Gill. She is from that area. She has the most to do in this one, Yaz. Uh, speaking to Willa, done the investigation, being the empathetic character, utilising her policing skills that she has. It's good enough for Mandip Gill. It's a strong enough uh, performance here. She gets the most to do, but this, it's just, oh, I'm the empathetic um, voice. I'm kind of like the window in for getting some more exposition for you than actually having any any proper interaction with, with um, Willa, which is a bit, a bit of a shame. And when the Doctor comes in, she kind of takes over with a conversation with Willa and, and Yaz doesn't do too much. She saves Willa from the Mud Monsters at one point, but that's about it. There's not really much more to say about um, Yaz in this story. We then got the guest cast. Um, we'll come back to what I think is probably the best guest cast member in a minute. Uh, we've got Siobhan Finneran, who plays Becca Savage. Uh, this kind of woman with a bee in a bonnet about witch finding and getting witches away, but ultimately, is seen through by the Doctor and, know, and the Doctor knows there's something more to Becca than, than meets the eye. It's played pretty solidly by Siobhan. It's a nice little character and it works okay until she turns into a Morax at the end. And then this kind of yomping, not yomping, but kind of like, I'm a big bad and you will, you will free me. She doesn't quite pull it off as much as, as some other people could, um, I suppose, acting that role. It doesn't it doesn't quite fit, really. We've then got uh, Tilly Steele playing Willa Twiston. Tilly's all right. Uh, it's played with a kind of um, young naivety, naivety a little bit, I suppose. Um, it's played okay. Um, it, it's a nice little role to try and get something out of Yaz, and it, it doesn't quite succeed in there. But it, it's a nice little vessel of, of a plot line to help bind things together. She's the one that reveals that Becca's her cousin, and obviously um, the whole st background story with Becca and the how she's being converted uh, is kind of seen slightly through Willa's eyes as well, which is interesting. I think it's a nice little role. It works perfectly. It's a nice balance. It's also a great reflection of how superstition was so strong still in those days because Willa does turn at one point based on authority figures above her, in this case Becca and King James, forcing her to change her opinion when it comes to accusing the Doctor as a witch in that scene. And then we have, of course, the... The best guest cast, I think, is Alan Cumming. As King James in history is kind of known as a kind of bisexual. They, he plays on that a little bit, but he plays it with such a upper class pompousness that you do get sucked into the character of King James and the way he's played. And I think Alan Cumming was inspired casting. I think it was one of the best casts castings we have of the season, and it really does make the difference in regards to believing this character and not believing him and the history that Doctor talks about and the history that Ryan talks about with him about his history with his family and the fact that his father was killed by his mother and his mother never saw and he never saw his mother when his mother had abandoned him at one and that kind of utilization of that kind of history to kind of justify why King James is so absorbed with the witch find finders and, and witch, witch finding and witch trials and everything else is, is an interesting way of working about it. And I actually quite like the way Alan Cumming comes across here as King James and is actually probably, as I say, one of the highlights of the story. As I say, it works okay for about 35 minutes and then all of a sudden for the last 10 minutes it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like big bad monster, big bad monster wants to take over the world. Arr! And the Doctor goes, right, okay, I know what's here, I know what's happening here, I've, I've, I've figured out enough, here's your plan, exposition, boom, 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 you guys follow up with me, come, we're sorted. King James gets taken away by, by the Morax to become the vessel for the King of the Moraxes, doesn't quite happen, but it's, 
it's um, interesting how that fight the monster, kill the monster, trap the monster, um, all goes on in a rather quick succession. It's not really a build up as such. It's like two stories. You've got the 35 minutes of the build up about the witch trials and all the all the reveal about why Becca is doing it. And then it comes to this kind of pseudo alien story, which doesn't quite hit the mark. Um, and it does bring it down overall. It's interesting, the whole elements here. As I say, we've mentioned quite detail about the scene, which I think is probably the most pro one, two of the most powerful scenes. The scene where the Doctor's trying to explain the whole situation about it being an alien mud. And she doesn't know quite know the creature at this point, but knows it's an alien mud and knows it's... She knows it's an alien mud. She knows it's, uh, you know, it's a creature from outer space and tries to explain that to Becca and King James and Willa in the, in the forest and King James doesn't believe it. Uh, King James kind of start, starts to believe it. Becca turns it because she knows that the Doctor's close and tries to turn it away from her. King James then follows and then Willa follows and that whole manipulation and the way that's played is actually quite well well done and it's one of the better scenes of the story. The other one is the confrontation when the Doctor's waiting to be duked in, uh, in, the, in the river with the ducking stool and uh, the conversation with her and King James and how that she's psyched out that King James has a deep um, sadness in him about his, his upbringing and his life and how he's used the witch finding as a vessel to try and cure him of having Satan, more or less. And it's a nice little conversation between the two and the whole fact that um, the Doctor's made it clear he doesn't know exactly why Mary Queen's Scots never, never left him so early and things like that. And it's an interesting conversation. I think that's quite a nice little two-hander between the two of them. And they do play off each other really well. And it's a really lovely scene to watch. And those two scenes are really the ones that catch me with this one and make it an interesting story for me to watch. And I'm really pleased that it's this sort of story happened. And it's the first instance, I think, of having a king or some sort of monarch from history in the series since Elizabeth I and Day of the Doctor. So it's interesting having that um, whole backup having that sit that situation happening again. It's interesting how the Doctor's reliance on the sonic screwdriver doesn't actually have too much of an effect and it confuses her because it she's scanning for everything thinking there's alien tech somewhere and this mud doesn't give any result initially and it's interesting how that works out and how the Doctor's reliance on the sonic screwdriver which has been heavily influenced throughout the whole series doesn't come to fruition here. She had to use other elements to give her clues. And it's good to see another way of digging into the Doctor's character. And this is a great example of it. Overall, I think it was a good piece. For me, it was a three and a half TARDIS out of five story with all the interactions and the way the plot line was and the building up of it for the first 35 minutes. And then when the monster comes about, it kind of dips a little bit. It's not terrible. It's not Arachnus in the UK terrible. It kind of dips a little bit. And it's kind of like it loses its steam and it doesn't quite... Uh, match up the previous 35 minutes so it brings it down a little bit for me it's a messy conclusion um, it does conclude but it's not it's not wholly satisfactory it's rather rushed it's rather quick it's like they've realized on the script oh we've gone too long into this we need to wrap this up quickly and it's kind of similar to what you get with some of the classic series where you have a overarching plot for three episodes of a four-part story and then everything comes together in the fourth part rather quickly the difference with that is um, the way it's written, you know, it, it's kind of slow and meandering. So it's more of a, a more of a, a crescendo. Here, it builds and builds and builds and builds, builds and builds and builds and builds and builds and builds, and the payoff doesn't actually work as well as it could do. And for that, I'm going to give it a rating of three tardises out of five. Okay, let's see how that story stacks up with the other stories in the Jodie Whittaker area, volume one. So we'll see how it matches up with Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror, and also how that story fits in within the rest of the stories I've reviewed so far from the TV series. While Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror gets three and a half TARDISes out of five, the Witchfinders could have been the same if it wasn't for the last 10 minutes, but it only gets three TARDISes out of five. It doesn't put it in the bottom though, overall, there are still two stories less than that in the rating, which are Time Lash and Sleep No More with two and a half TARDISes out of five, but at the top, there are still six stories with four and a half TARDISes out of five. They are The Happiness Patrol, Inferno, The Day of the Doctor, The Case of Androzani, The Tomb of the Cybermen, and Dalek. What do you think of The Witchfinders? Leave a comment down below and let me know. Do you like it? Leave a comment down below. Do you not like it? Leave a comment down below. Thanks very much guys for watching this video as always. If you like it, don't forget to like it and share it with the hashtag TeamStoctor. 
Also, if you like the channel as a whole, want to see more, best way of finding out when the next videos come out and when the next post for the community tab and everything else come out is to hit that subscribe button and notifications bell so you'll be know when a new um, item comes up. General, new video every Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT. The next video is actually a review of Black Orchid on Wednesday at 6 p.m. GMT. Hopefully you can join me for that. Um, and if you want to help support the channel, you can go to all the social medias. You can go to Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram and Patreon. Uh, for little as £1 or $1 a month, you can help support the channel at patreon.com forward slash deanstructor. There are three tiers. Uh, tier 1, £1 a month. Tier 2, £2.50 a month. Tier 3, £4 a month. Usually, level 3 team Teamstructor will have additional videos that you guys can watch. But until the 28th of February 2023, you get a chance to see the extended version of Frosty the Snowman Kids Doctor available for every patron. So all you need to do is go to patreon.com forward slash deanstructor. That's it from me. Thanks guys for watching. As I say, back Wednesday with Black Orchid review for um, Peter Davison's era. But until then guys, thanks very much for watching. And you know what? I'll see you later.